It's Speaking with Gravity. On this podcast, we talk about mental health and how everything affects everything. With every episode, the goal is to have a conversation that will make you think, make you feel, make you do what is best for you. This isn't therapy. It's a podcast. Welcome back to Speaking with Gravity. Um, today I'm hosting by myself and I have a return, a return guest. Uh, he came in last time and gave us such um, positive messaging that we had to bring him back again uh, for a second go around. Today we're going to be talking about <clears throat> restorative practices, getting the most of our, out of our kids and in this episode, we're going to talk about how you can strengthen and relate and restore your relationship um, with your child, giving you strategies on nurturing health connections with them. But today, joining me, we have Dr. Tawo Bartsdale, uh, who's going to give us uh, a little bit about himself. Just tell us you know, who you are, your journey to get to to where you are. Give us a little bit of background about your journey. I don't think you did that last time. Okay. How you got to to Dr. Tuo. Uh and and I'm a I know you don't care about me saying doctor. You always tell me to call you Tuo. But if I don't give you that respect, how can I get mad at somebody who else somebody else that don't give you the respect, you know, somebody that don't look like me who just chopping it up with you i want them to respect you for what you've accomplished what you've done what you bring to our community and so i need to 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 stand in place and do that first and foremost so i'm gonna call you dr Tuo, even though you've already told me i could just call you Tuo. okay so just tell us how you get here how you get to the point where you at well first of all i appreciate that yeah i appreciate that um you know if you work hard for something then you know Mm -hmm. you earn it then that's the expectation that's what we want to pass on to our kids and to our community as well so thank you so much for that um but man just to tell you how i got here is probably a show within itself (laughs) (laughs) um but i'm i'm from clinton which is right down the road but um i started off not cleveland no not clinton Clinton, with the with the t not clinton clinton a lot of a lot of clinton for clinton people say clinton but I uh, went to South Carolina State, Bulldog. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I started, I was an electrical engineer major. Wow. Uh, my mom was in education for 40 years. Uh, she would try to indirectly suggest me to consider education. Mm-hmm. I was like, nope. <laughs> so I already had my mind made up about engineering. Well, the funny thing about math and science, I always loved math and science, but math and science kicked my butt. Really? So that sophomore year, math and science started getting at me. Um, I was I was talking to my mom. I was like, well, you know, I was trying to find something different to do during the summer. I mean, when I came home, like for the winter summers, I was working with this architectural engineering firm. Um, so she suggested me to do substitute teaching. Hmm. And the rest is history. I fell in love with education when I started doing substitute teaching. Hmm. Uh, changed my major to education. Um, and, you know, I was in the elementary school classroom, taught seventh grade for a minute. Um, I went back later and got my master's of arts in teaching all subjects uh, with emphasis on urban education. Um, and then a few years later, I went and got my uh, doctor of education um, in organizational change and leadership, which is all really about culture building. Mm-hmm. Pretty much is what it is. Um, but re- what really drew me to this work? And again, I, I will not go and, and speak on any platform without giving my son, Alon, a shout out. What's up, Alon? Um, we're going to talk about restorative practices, I know. And I was straight to, which we'll talk about what to, to means. But I was punitive, do this or else, until he came along. Mm. And then it really reshaped and reframed what I thought from a standpoint of how I need to interact with him being his father, but then also how we need to interact with children. So my research and my doctorate kind of led to what I do from a standpoint of building culture, culture audits, as well as restorative practices in or in school communities. So at this point, we, we, uh, we do a, a QD at an hour um, to kind of introduce the, the episode. <clears throat> and QD of the hour is a version of fun facts, information that you can give to 
um, your family, your friends, coworkers, church members. So evidence suggests that restorative practices positively impact student behavior. It reduces disciplinary outcomes and disparities and improves school culture. You just said that. You said it's all about culture. Um, by promoting student investment and responsibility for a shared school community. Restorative practices prevent and address conflict and wrongdoing by proactively building healthy relationships uh, and a sense of community, which uh, I gather that from Learning um, Policy Institute. So that being said, you gave us a back, your background, uh, what led you up to this, to this point in, in life. Give us um, uh, an overview of what restorative practice is. Um, and, you, and you said you mentioned something about it, too. So mm -hmm. give us an overview of restorative practices and we'll go from there. OK, well, first, let me start off by dispelling some myths, OK, because I think a lot of times when people think about restorative practices, they, could, they think about no consequences. Mm. Um, they think about <laughs> that was going to be fact, one of my questions. <laughs> yeah, they think about no time, especially in educational environments. Mm. They think about the struggle for time because everything in the education system is intended to be done like yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, well, at its core, when we talk about restorative practices, the aim is to build community, build relationships, and repair harm. If we're talking about building community building relationships, repairing harm, and restoring, if we're talking about doing that, those things take time to do. Mm -hmm. So it kind of runs counter to what happens in a lot of our school cultures because everything needed to be done yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, it operates from, it being restored to practices, operates from the position of the fundamental hypothesis, which means that individuals are happier they are healthier and they're going to actively, more actively contribute to the organizational culture, school, whatever the case may be, if those in authority are doing things with them instead of to them, for them, or not at all. So when we talk about the social discipline window, we can talk about that a little later on, mm -hmm. but that's at the cornerstone of it is just building at building relationships, building community, as well as restoring harm, repairing harm where there's been harm. So how, how do I, um, from a parent standpoint, build a relationship? And when I ask that question, it might sound like a stupid question, right? Like, you know, it's, it's my child. Mm -hmm. We got to, you, you would assume or think that we automatically have a relationship. But you have to build, in any relationship, you got to build it. Um, how do I do that with my child? Because uh, there are discipline issues that, or, or you have to respond in a di with discipline from time to time. Um, and then and for me personally, uh, I was always one of those, um, I'm the daddy, you're the, you, you're the, you're the son or you're mm -hmm. the daughter, mm -hmm. um, which can negatively affect building a relationship to sometimes depending on the child. Mm -hmm. So how... When we're talking about building relationships, what, what are we talking about? How are we get how are we going to get there? I really appreciate this show and these segments. I mean, the the first segment I did was dealing with relationships, kind mm -hmm. of a, from a broader capacity, a broader perspective. Mm -hmm. But the first thing we have to do is start to unpack the way things always have been, mm -hmm. what our modus operandi is, the mm -hmm. business as usual context. Unless or until we do that. We're going to consistently do things that are going to perpetuate getting the same result. And you know what? That's defined. We, we do mm -hmm. the same thing expecting a different result. Mm -hmm. So having said that, I think one of the first things we need to do is unpack a couple of words. Uh, the first word we need to unpack is accountability. Because when we talk about accountability, um, society has us thinking that accountability looks a certain way, you know. Accountability, for the most part, if we think about it, is punitive. So it's a punitive type thing where we hold people accountable. It's not really something where, and that's it kind of goes back to restorative practices, no consequences. Because just because I don't give you this 
assign you this punitive consequence. Consequences can be negative or they can be positive. Mm -hmm. Positive reinforcement is accountability. Mm -hmm. But also setting expectations and now working with you to achieve those expectations, that's also accountability. So what restorative practices requires us to do is unpack some of these bigger words. Um, to your point about parenting, um, many of us govern ourselves and we parent from a perspective of how we were raised mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So it's generational. So my parents did it. Now I do it. And now subsequently it's passed down. But are we assessing the effectiveness? I mean, I, I get the cliche. You spat a rod, you spoil the child. But the rod is accountability. And does accountability, the rod of accountability, always have to be with a physical hand or a physical strap? Accountability can be broader than that. And that's really where we have to go into, like, unpacking what that means. So as a parent, I think the best thing that we can do and the thing that I had to do was begin to reflect mm -hmm. on self-reflection. Very important. One of the things we want, and, and just being an educator and being in an educational setting, we want children to reflect. Mm -hmm. We want them to be have a degree of self-actualization and uh, kind of realize some things. That takes reflection. How much do they see us doing that? How much do they see us modeling that? Not often. <laughs> <laughs> so so if, if, if they don't have a, a baseline or they don't have a basis, so essentially we're asking them to do something that we really have not taught them to do or we have not modeled in and of ourselves because we have taken what we have, have been accustomed to and we just supplanted that into our experiences as a parent. So self-reflection is one thing it really takes uh, to get there. But then also recognizing and realizing what accountability is, you know, and it's not necessarily that thing that we that's always been associated with our culture and our societal environment. So you, you mentioned consequence, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna give you a situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna give you a situation. So we're using restorative practices. Um, I'm gonna use um, myself and my parents. If Curvin is going to school in today's time, and I have the capability of making all A's. Mm -hmm. I'm consistently coming home with C's. Um, the thought in today's time is, oh, well, I took your phone. I'm gonna take your phone. Yeah. All right. Which uh, is along the lines of punitive, what you was talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm using restorative practices, what would I better use? Or is that okay for me to take the phone? Okay. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that point up. Because restorative practices does not mean, well, first of all, let me get into the social discipline window. Okay. Because according to restorative practices, everybody fits into one social discipline window. And in the social discipline window, we have two axes. Um, the Y axis is control or accountability. The X axis is support. So essentially, everybody is going to have be somewhere in that continuum as it relates to support as well as accountability. And that makes the social discipline window. At the top of the social discipline window, so just assume we have high control, high structure, high accountability here. But then on the x-axis, the support is low because support goes that way. Then that's what we call two. Two is punitive. So essentially, that's going to be sit down and shut up. Mm -hmm. That's going to be do as I say, not as I do. Do it or else. Ultimatums, threats. And essentially, we have different types of edu educators. But we have a lot of two educators. And many of them come from old school. Mm -hmm. But we have some new school educators that way. We also have um, where there is low support as well as low accountability. So, and again, I'm not knocking those who are about to retire, just kind of, I, I use this as training all the time. But if, if summer's about to be happening like tomorrow from mm -hmm. an educational perspective, if summer's going on tomorrow and summer's going on in the classroom, you know what, whatever, just, you know, whatever, just do, do your thing, do your thing. I get out of school tomorrow anyway. Mm -hmm. That would be the not. 
that's categorized as neglectful. So you have two, which is high structure, low support. You have not, which is low support as well as low structure. But then if we go further out on the X axis, we have high support yet low control. That is categorized as four or permissive. So we have the two, we have the not. Four means that, okay, Kervin, I see that you haven't done your homework. You need to do your homework, okay? Thanks, Kervin. All right. I come back again. You hadn't done your homework again. Kervin, you hadn't done your homework. I need you to get to your homework, okay? Thank you, Kervin. I go back again, and you hadn't done the homework, so what's not happening? I'm not holding you accountable. Right. There's no structure. That's four. Where we strive to be in with restorative practices is the with box. So with is in the top right. And I'm just I'm I talk my hands, so I'm trying to give yeah. you a visual. But the with box is high support, a uh, high support, and then also high control, high accountability. So what that looks like is curving. You know, we've had a conversation about you not, you know, working up to your potential or turning your homework in, being specific with whatever it is. Um how do I need to support you or how can I support you with this? And even offering suggestions on how I may be able to support you with this. Cause now I'm working with you to try to achieve that versus, okay, you're not doing it. So I'm taking the phone. That's two. What support have I given you? The support I'm giving you is punitive. However, have I invested any time and energy in actually helping you to achieve that? Maybe you don't know how to do that. Maybe you haven't had a model to do that. Maybe I need to come up with something that's going to motivate you further. And I think that's where we get into the punitive part is taking the phone. But maybe I need to be figuring out how to positively reinforce when you do it. But guess what? We supposed to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. That's societal. Mm -hmm. That's why we don't recognize positive behavior because you supposed to do the positive. So I'm going to give more attention to the negative. And I'm going to take more stuff away. Yeah, okay. yeah. So essentially, by giving more attention to the negative, what am I suggesting? You're reinforcing I'm, it, actually. I'm reinforcing the negative. Mm -hmm. So as it relates to what it looks like, uh, and to go back to ask, answering your question, um, from a standpoint of being too, sometimes we have to be that way. Uh, sometimes if it's a safety issue, mm -hmm. then I may have to be two with my with my child educators may have to be two with students so if there is a school incident that happens where it's about safety okay i need you to do xyz i need you to walk out this door i need you to go to the end stop it stop at the end of the door and then listen for my instructions that's two sometimes we have to do that sometimes if there is a um if there is a, a an infraction that is big enough at a school, yeah, there may have to be a two consequence. Mm -hmm. However, how do we reintegrate that student restoratively? Because we don't want to stigmatize that student. If a student does something, an infraction, that we want to, first of all, make sure that that behavior is what we are criticizing or trying to improve. Not to say this is a bad person. But I think a lot of times kids think that we're ostracizing them as people and we're alienating them as people when we should actually be putting our emphasis on the act, because that's how we reintegrate that kid back into the culture or the family. There are many families that are disconnected from school as well. Now, have you had any success stories with using restorative practice either in school or, you know, personally? Um, anything that comes to your mind when it comes down to, oh, okay, I've, I see. It's, it's one thing, you know, and me and you uh, in different in our careers have went through training after training. Theory, yeah. Theories mm -hmm. and uh, applying them. But it's, it, it sits differently when mm -hmm. you see that the theory is applied and it works. Mm -hmm. um, so have you been able to see – um, where that application of restorative practice have worked in a classroom, some somebody you yourself or maybe somebody else, um, yeah. My my personal experience with my own child, uh, 
Mm. Because a part of, we also have something we call walk to with. Uh, so, that? okay, going back to our social discipline window where we have the four different uh, yeah. social discipline windows. All right, my default, my autopilot, because I always ask as a trainer, what is your autopilot? I need to know where I am before I start trying to utilize this. And especially if I'm talking about trying to build relationships and community mm -hmm. as well as repair harm, if I'm a two person and I'm communicating with a four person, what is that communication going to look like? Mm. And then when we talk about like the shame affect, this gets a little deeper, but also what restorative practice says is compass of shame. Uh, if you are shamed or taken out of one of the positive affects, you're going to move to either withdraw, you're going to avoid, you're going to attack self and attack or attack others. A lot of times in school situations, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm, look, I got my coffee, so I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> I'm going 100 miles a minute here, but I'm going to go back. I'm going to come back to your question. But uh, a lot of times what's happening in school culture, school home culture is you have parents who have had bad experiences in school. Right. And essentially what happens is they already have a lack of trust with the school. But then school, either by verbally suggesting or by the other 93 percent of communication that happens without you saying it based on how I look at you, based on my tone of voice, says that you as a parent are illegitimate. Those mm -hmm. parents go somewhere on the compass of shame in one of those places. That's how you get numbers that are blocked and you can't get in touch with the, with the student can you, uh, or with the parent. Can you stay right there with the compass of, compass of shame? Can mm -hmm. you kind of elaborate on like what is that? Comp I know you, you're giving an example. Yeah. Just then of a compass of change. But what what's the I guess the definition or when we talk about shame and restorative practices, it's a bit different from the um our aspect of shame societally. Okay. Meaning that shame societally is embarrassment, guilt, uh, you know, humiliation. But what is that intended to do most of the time? It's intended to if if somebody shames you Especially when, from, from a parenting perspective. Yeah. And, and this is stuff I used to do. So going back to your question, going back to your question of success stories, I got better results from my son when I didn't engage in that behavior, mm. when I didn't engage in that. But if I'm two and I'm talking to him, which if I had to guess, I'd probably say a line is probably, man, it's hard to say. Um, he's probably somewhere in the, the four or not. He's somewhere down there because mm -hmm. he lets everything roll off his back. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm a two and I'm communicating with a four, that means that I had a potential to be overly abrasive. Mm -hmm. I may say something because I'm just tell it like it is. I'm mm -hmm. just going to tell it like it is. Mm -hmm. We call that keeping it 100. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're keeping it 100. Yeah. <laughs> keeping it 100. You know, if, if I'm alienating this person. Now I am pretty much excommunicating them from or I'm stigmatizing them from the community and the culture. That's how we get disconnect happening. So basically with the compass of shame, anytime it's a, it's a situation where I'm taking somebody out of that positive affect, whether it be joy, whether it be excitement, whether that's what we mean when we talk about shame. And usually what's going to happen if they have some type of context, they're going to go somewhere on the compass. So they're either going to attack me, they're going to attack themselves. We can't discredit that either mm -hmm. because of, you know, uh, death by suicide and stuff. Mm -hmm. But we can't mm -hmm. we can't discredit that. Um, and people who harm themselves want to do harm to themselves. Mm -hmm. We have withdrawal. We have avoid. So withdrawal is pretty much I'm just going to step back from the situation. Avoid. I'm going to run from it all together. So um, but as we talk about schools, we're talking about how that connects. But success story, when I started walking more to with, meaning that I learned how to be vulnerable, I need to learn how to have some humility and give grace. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started giving a line voice, then that's really the success story because a line learned how to apologize because I had to apologize and say, mm -hmm. you know what, I handled this wrong. I said the wrong thing. I shouldn't have said this. And subsequently, now it makes it easier for him to do the same thing. Was that hard as a father to say, I was wrong? 
Especially when, especially when you know whatever you're doing for him in that situation, you're trying to do your best. You're mm-hmm. trying to help. Mm-hmm. They'll have to come back and say, ah, I was wrong. Even though I was trying my best to help. Is that, is that difficult? That's why it's important that we self-reflect and we do reflection mm-hmm. on the way things, you know, what we may have been exposed to versus how we do things. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some people who have political affiliations mm-hmm. and they have certain beliefs and structures and systems just because that's the way it's always been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and essentially yeah. the same thing is the case. When we talk about parenting, we adopt something, but do we actually look at how effective and impactful it's been? You know, I hear people say all the time, well, I got weapons and I turned out fine. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you know, okay. I have said it. I have <laughs> yeah, said it. I mean, hey, I got weapons and I turned out fine. Well, this is, listen, there may be some punitive in being restorative, mm-hmm. but are you at, at what cost? Right. At what cost? People are also quick to talk about, you know, how honor thy mother and thy father. Mm-hmm. But the other part is that don't bring your child wrath. Mm hmm. Yeah. So they they forget that part. The don't child <laughs> is supposed to honor the mother and father, okay? Mm-hmm. But the role of the parent is to not bring the child to wrath, which means that that puts responsibility on the, the parent, parent to do yeah. that too. There's also another thing in scripture that talks about that teacher uh teachers are judged more harshly. Mm. So in the book of James Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. so teachers teachers are judged okay. more harshly. Mm-hmm. So everybody should everybody doesn't necessarily need to be a teacher because teachers are judged more right. harshly. Right. I bring that up because, you know, in situations where teachers, educators, administrators uh, just came from a training in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, it was administration. Administrators were in the training. Uh, teachers were in the training district office personnel were you know coming in and out and if it's a fully if if it's a full embrace and a full buy-in where you're willing to invest the time research suggests that you're going to see the outcome you're going to see a more positive outcome now what i will say is um there's no panacea to education it's like there's no panacea to parenting there's no panacea because we got a couple of things we got the human element Mm-hmm. The human element means that we're going we're gonna to jack it up in some way, shape, or form. But then there may be one person who may not necessarily respond to my initial restorative, but I continue to ask the question, how can I be more restorative with this particular student, with this particular parent, with this particular staff member? And in that case, you know, the results speak for themselves. There's research out about that. Mm-hmm. That's part of the reason I actually gravitated towards restorative practices in IRP, which is International Institute of Restorative Practices, because a lot of it lends itself to my research uh, that I did as uh, in my doctoral study. Um, we don't really put enough emphasis on the importance of self-efficacy and really instilling in people a belief in themselves mm-hmm. and by doing certain things but then also our practices may be well intentioned but they may not necessarily be the best practices to promote self-efficacy it promotes dependence yes obedience and dependence yes it, it, obedience it, obedience and dependence obedience. Yeah. now one one other point i want to make too and i always bring this up as well um i usually poll my groups that i train mm-hmm. and i ask them what is the autopilot of the broader context of schools? So the social discipline window, you got two, you got not, you got four, you got with. And I'll ask them, what's the default? So all things in, in ordinary situations, what's the default of school, the general context of school? What do you think their response would be? Obedience, obedience or compliance. Yeah, obedience and compliance, which speaks to two. Okay. Which speaks to two. What other system in our society <laughs> has that same thing? A prison. Prison. <laughs> the penal system. Yeah. 
So what I often ask is, <laughs> are okay, we training them to be in prison? <laughs> yes. So now when you have critics out there who criticize the school to prison pipeline, well, if our structure is the same as what the prison su- structure or penal system is, if we're doing two to the same capacity they are, then how can we dispel that? How can we dispel the school to prison pipeline? It's got to be relevant if we're doing business in the same way. But unfortunately, that's what accountability looks like. Accountability is look like that. So going back, I'm sorry, to your question. Success story, me as a parent, um, specifically um, the individuals that I've trained because I do coaching with them as well. Okay. They, they see where it is opening the door for more people to be involved. Everybody didn't get involved in the same pace. Everybody's not reacclimated in the same pace because everybody's trauma experiences, whatever is different, but get a lot of reviews from a context of just, you know, we're seeing a difference that it's making. So what is a, a takeaway um, that you would want people um, to have in regards to restorative practice, building relationships, building culture uh, in their home or could, could you use, you can use this outside of the home and school you can use absolutely. it for um uh, work culture too right absolutely um so what what did it take do do you go and work with like um outside of education do you work with like people i don't know a uh, ups um working or, on it I'm working okay on it. <laughs> okay I'm working on it. so that that's a possibility to be able to go and do that okay absolutely but what what are the takeaways then um, that you would want someone if they listening to this episode? What would you want them to gather? Most importantly, have an ability to um, or have a willingness to be self reflective, because this type of work is going to require you to do that. Um, also, in walking to with uh, where if you are from a leadership role where you are wanting to see something out of people, have a willingness to work with them in achieving that, allowing for grace, being vulnerable yourself. You know, I think sometimes, um, I think children, but then also people in general, when they see people who are in leadership, don't really know the struggles that they've had. That's a leader being vulnerable and sharing those struggles, mm. being in the circle with them because every the trainings are done in circles. So what you say, parents absolutely need to you talk about vulnerability, mm-hmm. sharing past mistakes. You think parents need to be be able to share uh, this happened to me uh, or wh- whatever in order to be vulnerable. Do they have to quote unquote have to? share their mistakes i think that varies from person to person right. however how powerful is that mm. because what sends people to the compass because if i'm stigmatizing them it's as though you never i don't it. do this okay okay yep you know and yep. what turns people off more than anything else is hypocrisy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know how dare you talk to me about something when I have examples of you doing or I find out later that you've done that. So how powerful is it to say, you know, yeah, I, you know, this is something that I experienced, even if it's not the same thing, all of us have our flaws, right. all of us have, have our deficiencies. So now we bring those all collectively into the circle. And now we are with each other, but that also shares vulnerability. Again, saying, I'm sorry. You know, I'm the adult. I I supply for you. I support you. I pay the mortgage. I pay for all these things. But then yet I, as the adult, as the parent, say I'm sorry. That's vulnerability. But guess what? I firmly believe that a line would not know how to say I apologize. And he's done it to me, too. Mm -hmm. He said I apologize for if it sounded like I was doing this. I apologize if, you know, or for what. Mm-hmm. And I, I I know without a solid shadow of a doubt it comes from me having the vulnerability to tell him that. So a willingness to be vulnerable is another thing. Um, but then 
we talk about investment. Um, well, investment means that you're planting seeds. And even though you may not get the immediate benefit out of it, you got to trust the process. Just like I was just on a plane yesterday. And one scenario I give, my, my mentor when I was a financial advisor said, to what are two types of people? There's the person who gets on the plane and just trusts that it's going to take them to the def- destination. Mm-hmm. And there's the person who wants to know the, the maintenance schedule. They want to know how the wings and the flaps, when they were maintenance. You know, they want to know all of that. But yesterday when I got on the plane from Kansas, as well as when I went, I had no information about the maintenance schedule of the plane. I just got on the plane and trusted that it was going to fly. So essentially believing enough in the process to trust the process to get on the plane and fly. And just go and let it take you there. That's what's going to promote Mm buy-in. Because if you don't have a firm conviction in it, then how can you expect anybody else to? And that's usually where we run into like a um, hindrance in passing this on and building culture and community with it. Because, again, it's easier to gravitate to what you already know to do. What was back here, it's easy to do that. Now I don't have to invest the time. I don't have to invest, you know, the change in my mindset because I can always go back to my default, which is, you know, this is the way I did it. I turned out fine. Mm -hmm. So why do I need to change anything? So just having a willingness to trust the process and to buy in and invest the time in doing it. So how can how can people find you that want to find you, want to put you to work? With coaching or um, trainings and stuff like that. Okay. Well, you can find me on the International Institute of Restorative Practices website under the instructors. However, I also have a website, uh, infinityaspirations.com. Um, on Instagram, I'm Dr. Underscore TJB underscore Infinity. Um, I'm not on Twitter. I guess I probably <laughs> need to be. But, um, and then on LinkedIn, just under Tawo Barksdale EDD. I don't know if you need to be on Twitter, man. It's, it's so much out there <laughs> yeah. now. Or excuse me, X. X, X, X now, now. yeah. yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just so much out there now, man. Yeah. It seems like they just, a different app come out every week now or if every other day. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Tuwo, for joining us today and shedding light on the impact of restorative practice and, and building relationships with children. Um, thank you for coming out and being with us again. Um, thank you guys as listener, listeners uh, for joining us and listening to us. Y'all could be doing anything in the world, but y'all chose to be here with us. And we appreciate it. So, this isn't therapy. It's a podcast. <laughs>